morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this session at uh, HCR's Cyber Conference. Uh, my name is Steve Thomas. I'm a partner in our commercial team, and I had a, a team of commercial lawyers in our Cheltenham office. Um, I'm a tech lawyer by background, having uh, worked um, for a number of years in um, in house in tech businesses, including uh, Marble Sterling Vertex in, in in Cheltenham. The in this session, we'll uh, be exploring how cyber businesses scale up and in particular, focusing on how um, startups attract early funding, the key steps to that and the um, issues um, uh, that will be attractive to um, potential investors and ultimately buyers to your business. Um, if you do have any questions as you go, uh, please through, uh, submit those through the question uh, tabs on, on the platform. But um, before we dive in um, to the session, can I introduce you to our, our, our panel today? To start with, I've, uh, I've got Inga Anson, who's a partner in our corporate team based in our Cambridge office. Um, uh, Inga's an experienced corporate lawyer advising on a range of, of corporate transactions, but in particular focus on tech businesses and tech start, startup businesses um, looking for initial investment. Um, Moving on to Nathan Evans, um, uh, Nathan, Nathan is a uh, partner in our commercial team, also based, based in our Cambridge office, um, and in, partic uh, in particular has extensive experience of, of advising on technology matters with, with big corporates. Um, last but not least, um, can I introduce you to um, uh, Daniel Lewis. Uh, Daniel's professional background um, includes spells as a software engineer, a web developer, and a data science consultant. Um, Daniel uh, founded Welsh cybersecurity company Alwen, Alwen Collective um, in, uh, in 2017. Um, Alwen Collective uh, provides software products to help uh, critical infrastructure businesses identify uh, cyber risks on their operational infrastructures. Daniel has been a, a, a research fellow in cybersecurity and digital forensics at the University of South Wales, and has also carried out PhD research into intelligent systems at the University of Bristol. So I think Daniel is very well placed to help us uh, guide us through some of the issues that uh, your businesses will be facing in this area. So Daniel, to set the scene, can you describe how AON Collective came into being and as part of that how you um, conceive the software products that you're now selling um, within your business. Yeah so um, it all started in, in early 2016. Um, I was a senior research fellow at the University of South Wales um, and I was working on, on a bid actually for, for European R&D funding um, related to uh, the cybersecurity of our most critical infrastructures. Um, and, uh, and this was actually the year of the Brexit referendum. Um, the, the referendum came around, uh, obviously this being a European funding um, uh, bid. Uh, and we had, um, we had uh, 10 partners uh, in, in that proposal. And due to the actual um, result of the referendum, partners dropped out. Um, we still submitted that bid, but unfortunately, um, didn't have the, the support from all of the different dimensions um, that we wanted uh, and therefore um, we didn't put in as good a bid, we didn't get a, a high enough score to actually secure that funding. Um, and so with, um, with a friend and a, and a colleague uh, we, we started to, th to think about what other things that we could do, um, what were the things that were related to, to critical infrastructure security um, where, where problems needed to be solved. Um, and one of the things that we were doing at the University of South Wales, we were actually doing uh, cybercrime investigations for, for the police, for the private sector, uh, for all kinds, of, all kinds of organizations. And mostly these would be for, uh, for laptops and, and PCs and uh, mobile devices and all kinds of things really. Um, but Increasingly, we were getting sent um, uh, devices from, from factories um, and from utility companies. And these are the kind of devices that control 
uh, water valves or manufacturing lines um, uh, and uh, all of those those particular control systems that you might find um, in those particular sectors. In comparison, doing doing um, an investigation on, the, on those systems is completely different than doing an investigation on a hard drive from a PC. Um, and so uh, we thought, actually, if we have the problem of, of doing that, that, that kind of investigation, then perhaps other people do. Um, and we thought maybe, maybe this could be a commercializable idea. Maybe we could turn this into a business. Um, about the same time, the UK government were, uh, were, were releasing um, a national cybersecurity strategy. And part of that particular strategy was um, the formation of, um, of an accelerator. Uh, this particular accelerator, um, which was called Cyber ASI back then, Academic Startups Initiative, um, sought, uh, sought out academic researchers within cybersecurity across the UK um, to train them up within, um, uh, within entrepreneurship um, and within business and to actually try to, to, to create some, some good quality um, businesses out of uh, UK universities. Um, and so, uh, and so we, we applied, we got a place on, on that particular uh, accelerator um, in 2017. Um, it was a, all in all, a nine month um, program. Um, and that trained me as an entrepreneur, that trained me into, in, into the business world. Uh, whereas previously I've, I've got quite an extensive academic and technical background. Um, and the, the idea really within that program was to, to exploit the, this, um, this forensics, this cybercrime investigation um, perspective. In the end, we decided that actually that particular idea uh, wasn't as workable as we would have liked. The market just wasn't ready for it. Um, and the, the business model um, would have been um, quite difficult to, to work while, um, while we were still, still working for the university. Um, but the program itself did give me a taste for the entrepreneurial market, it gave me some uh, mindset, sorry, uh, the entrepreneurial mindset. It gave me a view into, into the uh, um, industrial market as well. And so I decided to, to leave uh, the university, launch my own business, I went collective um, and went into it, went into it full time. Um, and I could go into it full time thanks to um, some early stage investment um, that, uh, that I managed to secure um, thanks to, to being accepted on a, an accelerator, another accelerator called the IoT Accelerator in Wales um, in, in early 2018. And that particular accelerator came with some investment. It came with, um, with 50,000 pounds of investment and it was led by uh, the Development Bank of Wales with a few other, um, with a few other investors uh, backing that as well. Um, and and that, that is what allowed me to, to go into this full time. Um, throughout 2018, we managed to, to work on um, uh, potential revenue. Um, we managed to secure, to secure our first project, um, which was with, um, with the company, uh, the international company called Raytheon, um, which we started in September 2018. Um, and yeah, that, that gave us our, our first bit of revenue um, and a pretty good first client to have. Um, so um, so I, that's when I started to, to kind of build up a team there to, to help um, develop uh, some software based on that particular project. Um, and, um, and we started to, to form ideas about how we to, could, um, could make products, software products. And so we, we kind of pivoted our idea from, from that investigation, that post-incident um, investigation side to uh, addressing more pressing needs within the market pre-incident. Um, and so nowadays uh, we, we say that um, OWEN Collective um, is, it's our mission to, to make society safer by reducing the risks, uh, the cyber risks within critical infrastructures and um, increasing the resilience uh, of, of those 
uh, critical infrastructures. Um, so just for those that, that don't know, critical infrastructure is, um, is, uh, is any sector that, that we as society rely on on a day-to-day -day basis. So that includes energy, that includes water, uh, transportation, particular types of manufacturing. Um, it also includes healthcare as well. Um, and, um, and some definitions also put in finance as well. Um, and so that, that's really how, that's how things were born, really. Um, we've been growing since. Really interesting, Dan, thank you. So just going back into the, the actual creation of the products um, that um, I'm sure will start to form a key part of the value of your business. When you started working with your initial clients um, and developing products, how did that, how did it go? Were you, were you just in that lucky position where you effectively found a client that helped you develop the product and they, they, they in essence, paid, paid for it? How did, how, did you, how did you find that? Yeah, so I think um, our general kind of, we always wanted to, to be a products company. Yeah, so... So with a, with a product company, you, you tend to get quite good long-term value. Um, you, know, uh, you know where you're going, but of course you need to, to get that the kind of value proposition right for um, the, most, um, the most clients, really. Um, and so I think that we were in, in the fortunate position that firstly, we were uh, awarded some investment, um, equity investment, um, quite early on, um, and then secondly, thanks to various introductions, we we secured a, a project quite early on, and a project that was actually related to the idea that that we wanted to build anyway. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it, it's it's very much about knowing knowing who knowing what you want to do, knowing who your market is, and then just talking to as many people in, in the market as possible. Um, and then that way you can refine the idea to something that is, that is, um, that is valuable. Yeah, great. I mean, because as an industry, as a lawyer, um, I, I know that I'm, I'm as good as my last hour's work. And I always <laughs> really love the concept of having something that you can build, build once and use many, many times. And I think that, as you say, I think that's, um, that's the value in software businesses is, is you can create something that they can that you can use on multiple opportunities. So, I mean that often is the sort of that that is the holy grail, isn't it, in terms of building, building value in those sorts of businesses. So, following on from that, have you had the need to sort of get any subsequent um, third party funding for the for the for the business? Yeah, so we've actually been through um, three rounds of investment now. Uh, so obviously that, that accelerator in 2018 was our first bit of investment. Um, our second round uh, was an SEIS round in, uh, in 2019. Um, and, then, uh, and then our third round um, was probably classed as a seed round and it was early in, in 2021 this year. Um, and uh, and yeah, this 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 year's investment actually had its first international element as well. So um, the lead investor uh, is actually a Dutch um, investment uh, company. Um, so we've um, that that's added an extra interesting uh, element to our um, investment rounds. <laughs> Great. So you you've now got third party um, shareholders in your business, and I think we'll um, perhaps touch on that um, in the session um, uh, with with Inga and the, the, some of the maybe that that introduces some new challenges, I guess, um, to how you you run your business and, and the control you have, etc. But um, uh, really interesting. Um, so in, two, in terms of the key moments as you've progressed to where you are now in your business, would you sort of pull out any, any, any moments which you think have, have been sort of critical and how the business is scaled to where it is at the moment? I think, um, I think that the first milestone is actually um, uh, 
hiring our first people um, back in, in at the end of 2018. Um, we we went from basically just me full time uh, to, um, to to five people full time, um, and um, so that that was that was a little bit of a shock to me. I hadn't managed people before, um, but um, it was really good to 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 kind of inspire them with the, the vision and um, get everybody behind creating a, a solution to a real world problem. Um, so I'd say that that's probably our, our biggest milestone and um, uh, definitely the, the most exciting um, and the first. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then releasing, releasing products is always an interesting one. So we, we, released, um, we released our first product profile we released, released our second uh, product dot um, last year um, officially, and um, yeah, and then and then winning this investment from an international investor has um, has also been a bit of a an exciting milestone. Yeah, and um, so what one of the things that comes through from what you've just said is is um, I think certainly with cyber business, some tech businesses, you have um, the founders are very much technical um, people, have you put it like that, um, not, not entrepreneurs. Um, and I guess uh, perhaps, perhaps that's one of the biggest challenges is to, is to not focus, you know, not to be over-focused on, the, t on the, the technology and the technical um, processes within the product. Um, what sort of attributes and sort of what, got, what, what um, observations and guidance would you give to people in terms of the things that for, for people that be thinking about in that in that area? Absolutely. Um, I think uh, I've also been um, a mentor now to that first program that was part of the, the Cyber Academics Initiative, uh, although it's now called Cyber ASAP. Um, so I've I'm since been a, a mentor and a judge uh, for that particular program. And um, I, I see it every every year, and it reminds me of of, um, of back in in 2017. It's the mindset. It is all about the mindset. It's so so different from from being an academic or a technical person. Having that entre entrepreneurial mindset is completely different, because in in the academic world, you're you're thinking about solving problems just as you are in, in starting a business, but the, the the problems are solved because you as a researcher have, have an interest have a particular interest in solving that problem and it doesn't necessarily matter what other people think necessarily um you don't you don't need to to be paid by somebody at the end of the day um and so there's a there's a different it's a it's a very different mindset and that's actually one of the challenges that i had at the beginning is it's hard to, to, to change that internally, but also that comes out externally as well. So when I was doing those initial pitches to, to investors, to potential clients in the early days, I was coming across as, as an academic and a, as a technical person, not as a business person. And so in some ways I had to almost try to, to force myself to, to, I'm not gonna, I don't really mean dumb it down, but make it a lot more simple and a lot more easy to understand to people that are outside of my area of interest. Um, so that's that's one of the things that I had to work on. That's one of the things that, that I see over and over again with academics trying to, to start businesses. That's a good uh, link then into how um, the, invest, the investor community looks at um, businesses like yours I mean obviously they're looking at it from a completely different angle they're looking at it from a usually from a hard financial how are we going to make money out of this angle so I think that's a good opportunity to sort of um, to, to, to move over to Inga um, so um, just looking at it these sorts of things from the eyes of, of potential investors um, uh, Inga you've got lots of experience of acting for uh, uh, investors in this space um, can you give us a feel for the types of funding that, that uh, and Daniel's kind of referred to some um, that um, is available to, to, to early stage businesses in this space? Sure. Um, thanks for that, Daniel. That was great. 
um, and resonates a lot with um, the people that I come across pretty much on a daily basis. Um, so generally, when I when I see founder teams, they not many have not secured any money at all. Um, a lot of them have managed to bootstrap with some money from friends and family. Um, and this is a really, you know, it's a really good way for some of them. If they've got great networks and family have got great network, then, um, you know, it's, it's a really easy way to just get them started. And, and those are really your very, very early stage. They're just sort of sitting in the, in, in the bedroom beginning to figure this out. Um, and, you know, they're not particularly structured. Um, just mum or dad or uncle or somebody they know has, has given them a bit of money just on a bit of a punt. You know, let, let's see where this goes. Um, moving on from there, then you will you know, generally when, when they come to me, they've got um, some angel investors that are looking at this with keen interest, keen interest. Um, angel networks will invest in startups, um, but generally slightly more early stage. There are lots of these types of angel groups around the country. Um, some specialize in just tech and some specialize, you know, in specific types of tech businesses. So, so they can be pretty specialist. Um, there are some good advantages to it and there are some disadvantages. And I'll, I'll come to those a little later. Um, Daniel then mentioned accelerators, which is another, another great way. If you can get into an accelerator program you know, they also have some great benefits and can often provide some of that early stage capital. Um, the, the pros with the accelerator are that you get some pretty unique one to one mentoring and networking, which you can often get from an angel as well, um, depending on the type of angel you find. But then it takes a little bit of time to make sure you find the right angel who's got the right contacts and the right interest. Um, you're probably going to give away a little bit more equity with the angel group than you are perhaps with the accelerator. Um, but that's just, you know, one of the one of the, 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 the cons of doing it. Um, so you just need to be prepared for that. You know, good things about these methods of funding is you're not providing personal security in any way, as you would with a bank. But then you're very unlikely to be able to get bank funding anyway. Um, and as I say, you've got access to, you know, investor, accelerator, sector knowledge, their contacts, management skills, mentoring. And in both of these cases, angels and accelerators, they are well placed to make decisions really quickly um, so they can just get on and do it. Um, you've just got to make sure that you find you know, the right one for you. Um, and then lastly, another, another um, one that I see very, very often is um, grant funding um, and, and more predominantly Innovate UK. Daniel, you probably know all about Innovate UK. Um, and this is um, a public body funded by the UK government, the idea being to provide support and stimulation and innovation in the UK economy. Um, they generally require a business lead to help you make the application. Um, it's competition based. So you put your application in, you hopefully meet all of the eligibility criteria, and then you hope that yours is the winning proposal. And you know, Innovate UK grants can be pretty lucrative. You can go from tens of thousands to millions. Um, but you do have some criteria that you then have to go on to fulfill, like making sure the project's completed within a period of time, or, you know, they will only fund a certain per per percentage of um, the first stage of what you're trying to do. So that's generally the types of funding that these startups and early stage businesses will look for and get. Brilliant. So uh, one obvious point you made there, bank funding, um, generally <laughs> Not um, not an area that's it's worth spending a great deal of time on. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, it was pretty difficult to get before um, you know two thousand and eight. Um, it's even harder to get now, if at all. Uh, as I say, the banks will you know they will require directors' personal guarantees. They may even want some security, but I never see it um, at all anymore. I can see Daniel uh, smiling in the back. I think that resonates with your, with your experience. Yeah, quite often um, they'll, they'll just say it's not possible to get an overdraft uh, or a loan. Um, you might be a little bit more lucky with the loan in some cases. Um, there are some specific um, uh, business loan providers, um, but usually they'll want to see that you've had some, at least some revenue in the past year. So moving that on then, Inga, in terms of the characteristics that um, 
investors are typically looking at um, and I guess we're talking more now in the sort of terms of the angel investor um, group um, what what are the sorts of things for tech companies you make tech companies investable investable in, in, in your experience I think tech companies aren't hugely different to generally you know many many startups um, you know it depends on what what they're trying to do um, but the criteria, I would say, things that investors are looking at are probably very similar. Um, I think three key things to highlight would be the team, the product, and the market are going to be some key focuses for them. Um, and they will do their due diligence, and, and I know we're going to touch on that a little later. Um, but the team is, is, is critical. You know, these are the people that they're investing in. Um, so they'll, they'll want to make sure that they work well together. You know, can the investors see themselves working with that founder team? Um, Daniel touched on, you know, this mindset and the fact that you can be quite academic or technical in your approach. So the, the investors are looking to see whether you've got, you know, you're young, you're entrepreneurial, you're tech focused, um, but you may not have worked in, in industry before. Um, so they want to see, you know, can you, be, you know, become or are you dynamic, resilient, hungry, responsive you know they need to see a range of attributes in that founder team they will look at your skill base um, so if you're all you know highly qualified software engineers well that's great because that's going to mean a great product but who's looking at the financing who's looking at you know the market and, and the commercialities of this um, who's who's in charge of operations technical all of these they'll be looking to see that the founder team have these attributes uh, amongst them um, so uh, so that's one one really really key piece of it product clearly you know really important as well um, because this is what again what they're investing in what companies trying to create and sell um, so things with the product you know the, the, the biggest thing is is it robust and, and defensible uh, and what do we mean by that um, probably first and foremost, you know, in terms of it being defensible is, is IP. Is it, you know, is it protected? You know, can, could a competitor do this again? How difficult would it be for somebody to come along and try to replicate this? So if you have protected IP, fantastic, but there isn't always protectable IP. So then what are you looking at? You're looking at founder know-how. So it comes back to the team, you know, how are you going to make sure that you secure that? And, and brand, you know, first mover advantage is, is another good one. As I've said, how hard is it to reproduce this stuff? You know, and, and so there are lots of elements that, that make up, you know, whether it's a good market, is there actually some sort of unmet need for this? Because very often I'll come across companies that are creating things for the sake of creating things, but there isn't a need for it. So how are they going to sell it? Um, so, so that's product. And again, you know, DD will be key for investors on that piece. And then market, um, not something I'm imminently qualified to talk about. Daniel, you may be more so than I am actually trying to do this. Um, but again, you know, is there a market and, and are there strong channels to market? Can you demonstrate to investors that you have some, some key contracts lined up or key customers that are there waiting for you to produce this stuff. Um, so, you know, that's the, just one single you know, client isn't going to be enough. It needs to be, needs to be bigger than that. Um, so founders need to understand the um, uh, market access. Um, they need to understand where there are other competitive players and how they're going to manage all of that. Are there any you know, regulatory issues that they need to be thinking about. So there's an awful lot that goes into deciding, you know, is this a good founder team? Is the product an investable product? And, and is there a market for it? And so investors tend to front load their investment by making sure they've understood all of that in advance. Pretty interesting. And I think that's one of the, one of the that, uh, to topics that resonated with what Danny was saying is the team, isn't it? And I think, and, and that's certainly my experience, how important it is to get that bit right from outset and make sure you spend time um, when you're when you're employing your 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 staff that you get the right people. That does seem to be a really key element of this. You get the, your your business up and running. Um, a slightly technical point. Dan, Daniel mentioned Inga about um, 
EIS, EIS, um, tax reliefs on, on investment. Probably, are you able just to give people just a little snapshot of what that, what, what that involves and how that can be really attractive to investors? Sure, and yeah, Daniel will know all about this again. Um, so this is, this is really, really key to certainly angel investors and individuals, you know, UK individuals who are investing um, in, in UK companies. There are two types of release, uh, relief, sorry. Daniel mentioned SEIS, so that's your seed enterprise investment scheme. And then there's EIS that follows on from that, so your enterprise investment scheme. They are HMRC tax relief schemes that are designed to encourage individuals to make equity investments in startup companies. You know, these are high risk investments. So we're trying to incentivize people to do this and, and to get businesses moving. Um, designed again to help businesses raise finance where you know, it had become difficult to do that. Um, as we talked about the challenges of bank funding, um, the scheme and the relief it's available to people who make direct equity investments in companies that qualify under the schemes. So there is a there is a lot of detail around the investor and the company and the investment itself. Um, SEIS and EIS relief can apply to uh, companies that haven't yet started to trade. Um, so perhaps companies that are just currently carrying on research and, and development activities. Um, just some quick facts about these reliefs. So SEIS, um, an investor, has an annual investment limit of 100,000 um, and they can claim relief against income tax of up to 50% of the sums invested. Um, and then as long as they've claimed that income tax relief, they then get capital gains tax relief um, on the disposal of, uh, of those shares. So you can see why this starts to look really, really attractive to individuals. Um, EIS, um, so EIS is the follow on to SEIS. So you must have raised your SEIS investment first. You have to then be with a tiny gap, perhaps a day, a couple of hours, as Daniel knows, and then you move on to taking in your EIS investment. Um, and that's because there are some criteria around the amount of assets that a company has before you can raise uh, SEIS. On EIS, you have Investors have an annual investment limit of 2 million, um, but anything over 1 million has to be in what are called knowledge intensive companies. And then on EIS, investors can claim relief against income tax of up to 30% of the sums invested. Um, and again, once they've, you know, as long as they've done that and claimed that relief, they also get capital gains tax relief on the disposal. Um, so some really, really good incentives there. Um, as I said, a variety of complex rules that um, you know sit behind that. Things like the investors can't be employees or directors or a significant shareholder. Um, there, you have to satisfy the risk to capital ratio. So this has to be a genuinely entrepreneurial company where there is a significant risk to loss of capital. Um, and then there are some asset conditions for each of the companies. Um, SEIS companies, assets can't exceed 200,000 and, and for EIS, that's 15 million. Um, EIS, SEIS investments, companies can't raise any more than 150,000. And for EIS on an annual rolling basis, you can't raise more than 5 million. Um, so those are just some very quick facts, really attractive to investors. You really have to spend the time and the effort and sometimes a little bit of money getting these applications right. Um, but uh, once you've got some committed investors on board, they will ask you where you are in the process. Generally, you make your application when you have um, commitments. Um, HMRC don't like to look at speculative applications anymore. So they want to see some names, they want to see some numbers, and then they will tell you whether you qualify for it. Um, thanks, Inga. Yeah, I mean, I think it's certainly in my experience, the, the key thing there is to make sure is to um, get some professional advice early in the process so that you, you make sure that you are able to fulfill the conditions to that, to that, um, to obtaining those reliefs, because they can, can, as you say, be hugely beneficial to investors and they're really important. So, um, yeah. and they're, um, they're, they're, you know, the, the importance of them, you can't underestimate 
um, if a founder makes a mistake um, or the team make a mistake going forward and they accidentally do something that invalidates those reliefs, that is hugely, hugely problematic. So, you know, the biggest piece of advice I could give any founder is, you know, take advice on the application process itself, get that application right, and then make sure going forward that any funding that, that, that you get where you are making any kind of change to your investment and constitutional documents get the, the advice on that as well, because simply changing two words in your articles of association may seem harmless enough, but it could in fact be the death of the EIS or SEIS relief. So be really careful with that. Thanks, Inga. Um, good point. And so taking that um, conversation or thinking about investors on a stage, um, you touched on on due diligence it'd be interesting also to get daniel's view on this in terms of his, the early stage investment he's received due diligence generally speaking is something that investors will want to do on on businesses they're investing in particularly if they're making a significant investment um i think to start with could you just sort of get, get a sort of broad description of what the um due diligence process would typically look like for, for angel investors and any sort of key tips for, for for young businesses and how they approach that sure so so we touched on them you know they will be looking at the founders and they will they will be sitting down with the founder team they'll be having discussions they'll be getting to know them so there'll be a, a good element of face-to-face Due, due diligence that, that goes on. Um, they will probe into the product and the market. And most of that, when you're looking at, you're, you're, you're unlikely to get that level of DD with friends and family, I should add. Um, but when it comes to angel investors, you know, they will do, it, do this very much on a face-to-face -face basis. Um, they don't generally tend to send you the formal long questionnaire that you might get from a lawyer. Um, they probably just have from me a helpful bullet point list of questions that they might want to ask about the legal side of it. Um, but they are they are concerned about that. They are concerned to know that this is the share capital and you know the company has a clean history and there is nothing, you know, from a regulatory perspective we need to worry about. There are no IP infringement issues, there are no, you know, litigation issues pending. But for them, the key is getting to know the people, getting to know the product and getting to know the market. And that's all stuff that they will do around a table face to face and take away with them um, on the day. Daniel, any, any observations? Have you, have you um, been subject to any detailed rigour in the in investment um, <laughs> as you've had so far? Any, any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, we, have, uh, we have a few um, angel investors, single angel investors, um, and it, it is, I would agree, um, it, is, it is entirely about the, um, the getting to, to know them in both directions, actually, um, because you don't want somebody... Uh, an angel that that is is just going to to cause problems. Um, you've got to you've got to know each other. You've got to um, trust each other, um, really. So that's that's absolutely important. And thankfully, um, we've we've got three three good ones uh, from uh, all from the the technical world. Um, they've all um, spent time building um, uh, building different kinds of of technical businesses. Um, and um, and it's really useful to to have their experience as well, um, as well as the little bit of cash that they put into the the business. Um, they actually have the experience they, and um, the interest in 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 us growing. So that's that's very useful. Um, as for the due diligence um, from from those uh, those larger investors, um, yeah, it, it's really tough as a, as a founder. Quite often, you, you don't necessarily know the the answers in in advance of. Uh, of 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 doing that that process um some in in a lot of cases you don't know what they're going to ask either um but it's it's a long process um usually it'll uh from from our experience due diligence has well, the shortest time i think was a month and that's that was pretty quick um quite often um i've heard stories of things of due diligence lasting six or, or even 12 months um yeah, so it, it helps to, to be prepared, but sometimes there's there's just the unknowns there. I think as we touched on earlier, the development of of your intellectual property and building and protecting that is a is a key thing. That ability to create something that you own and then you can re, re, reuse it, relicensing. 
it. Um, uh, sort of turning um, more to, to, to Nathan Evans, just to give us some perspective on that. I think we, as we touched on, unless you're, unless you're a cyber business, which is a consultancy services business, and you're just, you're like, you're like a lawyer, you're, you're as good as your last well, hours work, you're just selling your time as well. Um, it, um, demonstrating ownership of IP assets, I think it will be a key sort of part of the due diligence process and fundamentally important in terms of building value. Um, from, from your point of view, um, Nathan, I think certainly it's, uh, my experience is it's, not, it's never a case of a business sort of creating a software product from scratch. Um, sort of clean piece of paper um, and you start just writing code. It's always a, uh, a sort of a, a mishmash of third party code, open source components, your own bespoke proprietary work. Um, Nathan, are you able to sort of talk through some of the issues with um, that, that, that these types of businesses face, how they might go about protect, protecting themselves and ensuring that you've got uh, maintaining full value in your IP assets. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It is a good link because I think one of the shortest questions in the DD questionnaire is do you own the IP or who does or are you licensed? And it's the shortest question, but it's actually the hardest to answer. And you touched on a few things there. So open source, third party owned software components developed by third party contractors. And you need to understand all of these things and have the answers pretty quickly because it is the most important question. If you don't have the answer, then you're going to look a bit silly. So I suppose taking each thing in turn, assuming no knowledge, what is open source? So open source is software, which is effectively third party software. It's, you know, it's been written by someone. It's licensed on terms that place restrictions on the way that you can use that software, incorporate that software into your own products or use software which is derived from that open source product. And it reduces your, 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 your ability, or at least it affects your ability to license on that software, sell that software or distribute that software. So it's important to understand what it is. The purpose of this session isn't for me to go through every single type of open source software, otherwise we'd be here all, all day. But sometimes I'm sort of, I ask the question, you know, what open source software have we got in the product? And sometimes, not always, but sometimes, you know, oh, none. Well, that's just nonsense. <laughs> Let's not let's not be unrealistic. I think I think that, that that all products have open source components. The real question is, have those open source components been licensed on a permissive or restrictive basis? And that's what you really do need to understand. So if you don't know whether you've got open source software in your product, just talk to somebody like Black Duck or something. I'm not, I, don't, I don't have sale, I don't have shares in Black Duck, but somebody like Black Duck who can go into the product and investigate it and find out what open source components are in there, tell you what licensing restrictions they're under. Um, and the reason you need to be mindful about this is because if you're accidentally putting so-called copyleft or restrictive licenses into your product, there's a real risk that the product overall needs to also be licensed on open source terms, which is great for the open source community, but it's bad for your commercials and it's certainly bad for the investors. So that's a big red flag. Um, and if, you know, if, how, how do, how do you deal with this? Well, it's, it's not really a legal question. It's not something that we can necessarily help with, but we can give you guidance as to what you should be doing internally um, to reduce the risk of accidentally using restrictive open source licenses and tip putting in place a coding manual that you give to all consultants who are on site, you give to all consultants who are offsite, all of your third party suppliers just saying, look, we appreciate that you may want to use open source software to help us develop our tool, but these are the rules of the game. You know, you can't use restrictive licenses unless you tell us about it, because it may be that a restrictive license is fine. You know, if it's a modular component that you can rip out and it doesn't infect everything else, then fine. But it's about knowing what the open source is, understanding how it's used and having a good story, I think, to tell the investors to, as to why it's used and what steps you take to manage the risk, because you will be asked in due diligence. Um, there's no question about it, particularly if, if, if we're on the other side. Um, and then sort of third party owned components. Again, there aren't that many products out there that don't have an element of third party owned products in there because, you know, it's, it, it's helpful, right? And software is increasingly modular and that's, that, 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 that's how these businesses are built. Um, I think it's fine to use third party owned components, but you need to be careful and always have a plan B. 
And the reason for that is that you often see third party components licensed on relatively preferential terms, good commercial terms, good initial term, all of these things. And then as that third party component becomes more, um, I guess, critical for continuing use of the software, suddenly you find the license terms might get a bit less commercially <laughs> friendly um, and you are in a vendor locking situation. So for example, in contracts that we write for software development, we make sure that there are no vendor locking um, scenarios that could occur using various bits of drafting, but it's just something to think about. Um, also have a think about, well, what are you gonna do when the third party software, which is vital for running your business or your component goes out of support? or it's sold. I mean, all of these, all of these things do happen. Um, and therefore you do need to think about the continuing support and maintenance of the product because the investors will be looking for something that's you know, gonna run for decades as opposed to the next 12 months, which is what most software is licensed on, on a rolling basis. It also does make your customer contract engagement more complicated if you've got material third party software involved because effectively you're having to flow through the term, the licensing terms you've got with your, with your third party um, software vendors uh, through into your contracts with, with your customers. So um, I, I, can't, I think it's, um, as Nathan says, it's, sort of, it's sort of inevitable that there will be those sorts of components, but just gotta be, I think it's aware, being aware of the complexities that um, they, they bring with with you when you're when you're designing the software in the first place. I think just just a final thought for third party owned software is yes, it's boring to read the licenses, but it's really important that you do because you need to get the license scope correct. Because you may think that you've been granted a license to put the software into your product and then allow customers to use it, but of course you may not have been. So you need to make sure that the license permits you to effectively on sell the software to third party customers and also don't fall into indirect licensing traps, you know, where you've got machines in the background or robotic process automation, which is actually using the software and is technically a user and you don't have a license to it. That can get you into some real, some real hot water. Um, and then I suppose the, the final point, Steve, you mentioned was, was components which have been developed by third party contractors. Get in place T's and C's get in place T's and C's because the author of the work will be the, will be the owner, the first owner, and, and the rights won't be assigned unless they're assigned in signed writing. So get in place T's and C's. Or if the IP is meant to stay with the consultant, which sometimes it is, make sure you understand what components are staying with the consultant and what that consultant can then do with that IP with third parties. Because what you sometimes find is that the licensing arrangements allow the consultant to keep all of their background rights and they say, well, we own our background rights and all enhancements to our background rights and that starts to build up. And then they can, they're, they're developing those rights on your dime and then they're able to freely go to the market and use it with your competitors. So, you know, think about whether it's appropriate or reasonable to have in place non-competes, non-solicits, all these sorts of things that are attached to the licenses that don't necessarily link directly to the license, but will dictate the way that you do business going forward with that particular consultant. Um, Jumping so in there, Steve, just going to mention, you know, it sounds, Nathan, sometimes like these things are theoretical risks, um, but they really aren't because I have seen them actually, you know, come, come to life in both acquisitions and investment transactions where, you know, the investor or the buyer has done their DD um, and it has cost very real money. You know, um, it's cost investment. Investors don't want to invest money to fix problems of your making. Um, and likewise, you know, buyers don't want to be left with a many, many hundreds of thousands of pounds bill to rectify or pay somebody for the use of those licenses, which is an instance that, that we had. Yeah, I, I, I would just say the final thought on it is, is definitely talk to your lawyer about the best practices and consultancy agreements, because Although it sounds complicated for us as technologists, we see this all the time. It's not necessarily expensive and you know, there's nothing new on the sun. We can assist you with it. Just don't bury your head, I think. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, the reality is the legal documentation around that can be really, really simple. Mm -hmm. it's sort of really. Signing the IP from a contractor to, to, to your company if you're engaging um, independent contractors as opposed to doing work yourself with your, with your own employees. So actually the legal stuff can be really straightforward. The, the fix can be really straightforward and simple. Um, 
Daniel, any any um, any observations on, on on that piece in terms of your experience of of, of those of those issues? Yeah, I think um, just taking a cyber perspective here as well. Um, any use of a, a third party um, product, whether that's software or hardware, uh, within um, within your own development. Um, Incre increases the chances of, of vulnerability to your own product um, as well. So I'd like to think that those people starting cyber companies will consider that as well. Um, I'm, I'm sure that they will. Um, and it has certainly been, been the case for us as well. Um, of course, we use uh, open source uh, software ourselves, um, both in the development of our product or products um, and, uh, and as part of um, as, as one of the components. Um, and um, yeah, we, we've, we've gone through that, that whole license checking um, process and um, yeah, and, and being clear in our due diligence that that is, uh, um, that is, part, of, um, that is part of our software and our, our development processes. Um, and it, 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 it is a risk. It's probably quite a small risk, um, but it's, it's uh, is something that should be considered. Um, the, the other side of it is um, we've, we've purposefully um, made the decision um, to develop, uh, develop our software ourselves um, rather than use third-party contractors. Um, this is, is for, for one of those cyber reasons um, uh, to reduce the vulnerabilities, but also it gives assurance to those um, to those people that we're selling to that actually we know what, what we're talking about um, and uh, our product does does exactly what we're saying it does. Um, we haven't we haven't shipped the development of this out to, to, to anywhere. Um, it is something that we have genuinely developed ourselves. Yeah I'm sure that would give investors um, a, a lot of, a lot of confidence. So I suppose that covers inward licensing, doesn't it, Steve? But but in, in terms of outward licensing and how you develop business through licensing your own products, uh, yeah. how tech businesses can build their value through effective licensing models. Yeah, I think that was a good sort of um, link into that part of the conversation, Nathan. Is because I say you've 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 started to value your products. Your product's gone to market. You're confident that the you understand the third party um, own components and sort of the source code, uh, source code components. So you, you're ready to go, you're ready to say to clients, yeah, we own this off the, off the software, we're just about to license to you. It's not going to be, there's not going to be any third party infringement claim. So the next sort of part of it is, is, is how you maximize value by um, licensing it in a sort of an effective and, and um, value creating way. Um, any thoughts, um, Nathan? Perhaps from you to start with on 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 the sort of considerations there. <laughs> yes, I think, think about the subscription model. Are you granting perpetual licenses or, or 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 annual licenses, and how how are you going to structure the fees associated with those licenses? Is it going to be a single license fee for use of the product wholesale, or are you going to have a per user license fee? All of these things, and it's quite complicated, I guess. To, to, to write down, but as lawyers, what we need is a bullet point list of what you're trying to achieve commercially so that we can put it into the, put it into the fee schedule when we're writing your standard T's and C's. Daniel, how, how do you go about licensing your software? Um, so yeah, a little bit of a mix, but, and it's probably made even more complicated by the fact that we have two products as well. Um, one of our products is a, is, um, a monthly or a yearly subscription, um, and it, that kind of fits in very easily with that particular product because it is a uh, it's a web application. It's um, a software as a service basically. Um, so um, so that's that's fairly easy. Um, our other products we've made to be as fl flexible as possible. Um, so it depends on where it's deployed. It depends on um, how big the deployment is and the level of support that we're giving. Um, but um, but we. We go for, for a subscription model, um, whether that's a, a, a short term or a long term. Um, and the idea there is really so that we can provide updates as and when they come through. Obviously, it's very important from a cyber perspective that, that we are providing um, updates into 
uh, into the, the vulnerability database that's in, in our second product dot. Um, and uh, the way we're keeping the vulnerabilities of that product itself as low as possible too. Um, so, um, so that's why we go for a subscription mod model because we're providing that extra service on top, really. Um, uh, and certainly, um, Danny, from, from my experience, that's what investors like to see. That um, an ID is sort of a, sort of a contracted revenue stream that goes into the future. I think it's increasingly difficult to get long, longer term contracted revenue sort of beyond the year. But um, that's, the, that's the holy grail, I guess, is to try and get a committed um, revenue stream, subscription income, two or three years going, going forward. Absolutely. But it's also important not to forget about the shorter term stuff as well, um, because actually, depending on who you're selling to. So for example, we often, uh, we often work with service partners and sometimes they, they want a two or three month project. Uh, and so it's, it's a, there's no point in them actually having a, a longer term license uh, in that case. And it would be silly of us to actually turn down that, that revenue. So um, it makes sense for us to, to, to be flexible in that way as well and not forgetting the short term work yeah um, just remembering that it does terminate at the end of that project yeah and, and the, the other observation i would have is is is, is as nathan sort of touched on there's there's lots of different licensing models whether it's a user base back in the day it used to be sort of on the processing power of the computers that software was run on etc so a whole range of potential things are, and from my perspective, I suppose the key thing is that you think about the value that your software is creating in your customer's business and try and link your licensing model to that. So that you, that, so as that value grows in a customer's business, you you get your fair share, <laughs> you get some some fair share of that um, incremental value. So if you just had a, you can use this this software in your business, Mr. Customer. Um, that's pr obviously pretty broad and, uh, and, and doesn't give you the scope to sort of can, to share in, the, in the, any increased value. So that's the sort of, that's the key thing. I, I guess that's where the user base models and those sorts of things come from is it enables you to, 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 to increase your revenue as the, as the use um, increases. I suppose one, one thing to definitely touch on that outside the licensing model is that there are things which are outside of your control which you need to think about when you're structuring what your what your licensing model is and make sure that your contract has flexibility to flex your charges when, say, for example, your hyperscaler turns up and says the fees for this coming year are going up because you might need to pass those fees through to your through to your customer base. You may not want to, but but you might have to. Um, also, if as your business is scaling, if you are working in multiple jurisdictions, think about maybe there are some currency risks. You know, um, changes in currency uh, changes in currency might 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 have a, a negative impact on your profit margins that need, they need and there needs to be a mechanism addressing currency fluctuation, for example. Or if it's a long term contract, which is say I don't know five years long, does there need to be a point within the contract within which you can index? And have a look at what's going on with inflation. Um, so just have a think about all of that stuff. It's not, it's it's never usually just simply well this is this is the user license fee and this is it plus that. Um, interesting. I think there's some interesting observations there. Um, so just moving that conversation then on in terms of um, the sort of licensing of a software products and and the contracting. Um, Daniel, you, you referred originally to Raytheon and, and, and doing business with them. And I guess as a startup, you might they might have been um, kind to you and didn't say that, well, here's our standard T's and C's, you know, that's it. Um, but um, I, I think so, certainly in our experience, that's one of the real big challenges for um, smaller tech businesses when they start to engage with big corporates and 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 you do start to see the risk of big, big corporate saying, well, we own, you know, we own everything sort of thing. And, you, you know, you risk losing the IP that you've created. Um, Nathan, starting with you, and I'll come to, come to you, Daniel, sort of, 
any what you, you work a lot with um sort of rising big corporates any sort of sort of key tips um for people to take away when when uh, playing in that particular pool, uh, pool so to speak this is delicate because i love my big corporates obviously <laughs> they're fantastic <laughs> what i would say is that broadly speaking no two corporates are the same they all have distinct and separate personalities however what they do have in common is that they all very much process driven. They have their questionnaires, they have their security requirements, they have their policies and you need to effectively just comply with them or figure out good reasons why you can deviate from them. Um, you'll often be asked to contract on, on the corporate standard T's and C's, which will put you at sort of IP risk for the reasons that Stephen has just mentioned. And some will allow you to use your own terms and conditions subject to their own policies, etc. cetera. Um, so, I would say as, a, as, a, as an early growth business, you need to develop a really methodical approach because that's the way that corporates operate and that's what they expect and it looks professional. You need to develop some patience. I mean, the, 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 problem, the problem with being a startup is that you're always rushing to get the product out and you want to get all these deals signed. But the, the, the fact of the matter is with a corporate, you go through the, the initial sales team and then you have to go through procurement and then you'll get the insurance signed off and then you'll go through InfoSec and it, the, the processes are quite long. But I've taken lots of businesses through these processes and we almost always get there. It just takes some time and it will take longer than you think, plus probably another two weeks. Um, it will help to have a really good understanding of your own terms and conditions. Well, it will help to have terms and conditions in the first place. So <laughs> write them down. Um, it will be really helpful if you understand the regulatory framework within which your business is operating, but also the, you know, the business that your client is operating within. So, for example, if you are selling products or cybersecurity products or whatever it might be into financial services, it's probably a good idea to understand the regulatory framework within which those businesses operate because they're not just regulated because of their banking functions, they're regulated in how they receive services and how they outsource to third parties, how they stick data on the cloud and all of these things. So we can help you understand, you know, the markets and financial instruments directives and the EBA cloud outsourcing guidance and all of these things, which might apply when you're providing services to banks and you need to get your head around them and you need to understand, well, these types of businesses will be all over you, all over you will want to audit you, how are you going to, what are, what are your internal processes for being audited and, and things like this. So it's just, it's just a, a more complicated customer. Um, and so a, a final thought on this is that having in place the internal documentation for, as I say, your T's and C's, but also things that you need to comply with the general data protection regulations and um, understanding having your own internal security policies and your staff vetting policies and a clear understanding of how data maps across your business and how it is used all of this stuff if you have it readily available will make you look really credible and will help you along the way daniel do you have experience of that you're nodding away it sounds like this is ringing a few been through all of this kind of stuff yeah okay. for sure <laughs> i think um uh yeah with with our um with our first project um which uh um we 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 managed to 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 um work with them on particular terms and conditions where um we owned anything that that we created as background ip um and we had the the both parties had the freedom to to use foreground ip um, and it was specifically the, the project was specifically tailored to answer answer a particular question. Um, so um, it was more of interest for us to to create that background IP. It was more of interest uh, for the, for the client um, to to get that answer that question answered. Um, so um, that's that's kind of how we we managed to negotiate that one. Um, but yeah, we we've had it in in the past where where some, some prospects um, have remained prospects just because they, they're not willing to, to budge on, on their IP stand. Um, and um, uh, that's a shame, but as a product company, it's, it's all about the intellectual property and, and that's more important. And often it's the case that they're asking for quite large liability caps or completely uncapped liabilities as well, which 
when you're desperate for business, you might be willing to give. Just you need to keep in mind that your insurers will care. And, and, and when you come to get your insurance or to get reinsurance and they're, they're trawling all over your standard contracts, you might find it increasingly difficult if you've given away uncapped liability to 10 large corporates. Absolutely. And then just to pick up your other point on, on um, having uh, all of those background processes in place, um, yeah, from the from the very beginning, we've we've done um, third party background checking. Um, we've uh, uh, we we've always been working to to at least cyber essentials standard. And earlier this year, we actually got the, the certificate to say that, that we we've got that um, as cyber essentials plus. Um, we're also currently working towards ISO twenty seven thousand and one, um, but um, but that'll take a, a little bit longer to to get audited. Um, these things are quite expensive, um, but um, usually providing that you, you as, a, as, a, as a small business are working towards things, then, um, then in, in that whole procurement process with large corporates, they, um, they are often quite flexible from, from our experience. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So, um, I guess in my next sort of question is around, we all think businesses learn more from their mistakes <laughs> from their successes. Um, I think uh, just a general question to the, to, the, to the group and maybe starting with Daniel, is there uh, any sort of key moments, lessons to learn, mistakes that you think you've made, uh, things you perhaps regret in the process to date and you know, anything you could share with, with the audience that um, would be helpful? I think I, I try not to, to dwell on, on mistakes. We've certainly made a few mistakes along the way. Um, what I would say is that one thing that I would change, perhaps change, is I would try to, to form a sales advisory board quite early on. People that, that are, are just interested in our growth, that, that want to, to volunteer some of their time to actually come together to... Um, to, to, to help us on, on particular sales problems. Um, we have that now, um, but I wish that, that actually we would have done that a little bit earlier because that probably would have helped um, us secure some business faster, I'd say. Yeah. Any other observations then? Any sort of um, horror stories that you've come across, Inga, that we haven't touched on already? Yeah, you probably see me smiling here in the background. <laughs> For me, it's all about those those very early um, lessons, and they're really hard lessons sometimes that these founder teams um, have to go through. You know, they're always really keen, really eager to move as quickly as they can and, and get things done. And, and of course, there is a real focus on on doing that. Um, but at the same time, you just need to take a bit of time to make sure that you know you're you're doing and thinking about the right things. So. You know, I, I talked earlier about investors looking at the founder team and the skill base. Um, so, so something that founder teams should look at um, before they start making share allocations in their companies is what are what are the you know who are the key members of this team or what do they bring to this party? Um, because once you've made share allocations, it's really difficult to undo that. Um, and, you know, you end up in, in a situation, and I've seen this happen more than once, where the founder teams have, you know, a very, very single minded goal that they're all working to, but they haven't quite seen the bigger picture. Um, so they share the equity, you know, equally. They have no documentation in place to deal with any fallout. Um, and either there is a fallout before they got to the investors or the investors identify a weakness in that team and start to challenge how you know, you're going to manage this person. Um, and if there's no way of dealing with those challenges or those issues as they arrive, uh, arise, then, then you could be in a really sticky situation. So once those shares are allocated, you can't take them back. Um, so how do you then take 30% you know, of a business away from a founder who, you know, from, from his own perspective, has given an awful lot to this business over a year of his life, he hasn't been paid. This was effectively, you know, the thing. So be really mindful of making those 
big early allocations to people. And if you are going to do it, then talk to somebody who's done it or talk to an angel investor if you know one or a friendly lawyer um, just to say, if something goes wrong, how do I unravel this? You know, can I? Um, so just make sure there's a backup plan there. So, so that's kind of one of the things that, that we see. In, and um, uh, documentation, you know, yes, documents are important. I know it sounds really boring, but documents are really important because that's what's going to help you out of situations like that. Thanks. Thanks, Inga. So um, I think um, we've had a really um, sort of interesting um, conversation there through a, a range of um, the different challenges and issues that um, startups will, will face in terms of scaling up their business, uh, attracting investment. And I hope um, that's been really helpful um, to the audience. Um, uh, before we wrap up, um, uh, at the risk of of, re of repeating things we've already we've already stated, is there any sort of any final observations that people have? I mean, one of the, the I guess the key thing that I've I've noted, and I suppose this is to get somewhat of a lawyer's point, but forgive me, is governance. I think um, it, it seems to me that it is easy for tech businesses, particularly product businesses, to get really um, totally focused in the, in the development of the product and then and and not focus on some of the governance issues around ownership by, of the ip getting your contracts right making sure you're dealing with your ip things uh, issues with con con contractors quality open source all of those things um uh, uh suggest to me that um you know that governance piece is really important and uh, and um so uh, it's, it's, it's worth, and part of having the right team is having the right blend of people who, your creative people, your sales people, and your, your kind of, your, your organizers, your governance folk who will, who will look after those things. So I guess for me, that was a, that's a key thing coming out of this. Um, can I go around um, the panel and just sort of, uh, sort of take any final uh, observations or reflections on, on, on sort of key, the most important things that you think people should be thinking about in these in these businesses. Can I start, with Daniel. Um, I think that that this really evolves from from uh, from the founders' mindset. Firstly, I think that it also evolves from from um, uh, providing value to to, to, to the market. So I'm re there's a reason why I'm saying this. From there, you you create a kind of mission for a business, and from there you create a, um, the values for a business, and it's the values that then shape um, how you run run an organisation and what kind of uh, governance and organisational structures that you put in place. For us and um, at Owen, um, we we really uh, we we have an ethical basis. Um, we uh, we have got a value statement that includes um, agility, warmth as in empathy, um, uh, egalitarianism, basically equality, um, and um, and then next level innovation. Um, those of you with a keen eye probably realise that that's A W E N. Um, so um, uh, th that there are values, and that's that's what shapes everything from from how we develop our software from uh, how we engage with with clients, how we engage with each other as as a team, um, and all those other kind of stakeholders, um, and that uh, we have over time um, uh, evolved into um, into the more uh, structured uh, documentation around our business, um, whether it's um, uh, with those those um, documents that are required for ISO twenty seven thousand and one, for example or uh, business plans um, and all of the other kind of uh, doc documentations that go, go with, with running a business. Um, so that's, that's my answer to that one. I'd add to that, Dal, you know, it's, it's ESG is becoming, you know, a lot keener across, you know, various um, market sectors at the moment. And we are seeing all sorts of term sheets where there are conditions subsequent 
you know, you must report on inclusion and diversity and you must put in place all the right policies to make sure you're doing that. Otherwise, investors aren't necessarily going to be able to tick their boxes. So, yeah, completely agree. Rather than repeat the stuff I've already said, I would just put out a plea, really, is to, to talk to us as early as possible, because it's not the case that, you know, you pick up the phone to us and the clock goes on. It, it makes our life a lot easier if we're engaged nice and early and we can strategize what the business needs, what documents it's going to need going forward, rather than chasing our tails when suddenly something goes wrong and we need to write some T's and C's in three days. It's cheaper just to get us involved, <laughs> I would say. And, and, and just lastly on that, Steve, following on nicely from Nathan's point, thank you, is you know making sure you're investment ready. And we've talked about an awful lot of things um, on this today and the ways in which you could make yourself investment ready. Um, and you know you make you need to make sure that you've got that paperwork to hand. You can be nimble in your responses. It looks organized, it looks tidy, and that just comes across so much better. It really impresses investors when they see founder teams who've just got this stuff to hand and have thought about things. They appreciate that people will make mistakes. They appreciate that founder teams are learning a lot of this stuff uh, for the first time. But if you can show that you are trying at least to get it right, it makes a big difference. Great, Thank, thanks, Inga. So I think that um, uh, then um, draws um, the session to a close and uh, the last thing it leads me to do is thank my panel very much for uh, their wise words um, uh, and their engagement with this. I think it's been a really, really interesting uh, and engaging session. And I hope um, uh, everybody who's been listening um, feels the same. Um, uh, obviously, as we said in the introduction, if you've got any questions, we, we can now move to take those now.